approaching the path right from my head right from. Right from. Um, welcome everyone to um, our wonderful, wonderful Thursday evening with everyone on board. It's very exciting. Um, um, it's very exciting to be here to enjoy another Thursday in Women's History Month, which each and every one of you so very excited, very excited. I'm looking, at, looking even more forward to our um to our program um our program today we have some very exciting guests if everything work out, works out and we don't have any technical difficulty we should be having some extremely exciting guests coming on on uh, education up uh, uh secondary education and the lights right Right, a secondary <laughs> education and 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 the likes and and how the effect of especially students of color and how their impact on education. Uh, Want to make sure that we review um, how the Domino weekend went and then you know talk about some other things that are happening within our community. So welcome everyone to the uh, Village Radio Talk Show. My name is Roger Daly. I am your host. Sitting to my left is a Dr. Joanne Bryant, and muted on the on the screen is uh, Dr. Janelle Sampson, um, who is our uh, hosts and hostess um, of the evening. Um, where thank you for what thank you for joining, sharing, viewing, listening to the Village Radio Talk Show. My name is uh, Roderick Daly. Um, Dr. Dr. Bryant and Dr. Sampson have the same affliction, scariness to the um, to the mic, so they're going to push the mic away, and then you're going to have a hard time hearing them because they're germaphobes and they're afraid of the mic. So, um, please make sure that you know that we're dedicated to empowering the community to live a healthy, safe, and financially capable life through education helping each one of us in realizing our dreams at any age, at any point, starting from today. So a couple of things I need to get out of the way before we get started. One, to let you know that we're brought to you by the World Domino Federation. You can go online and see what they're doing at www.worlddominoes.com. We're brought to you by Grace Family Adult Social Daycare. Um, that's at 1330 Utica Avenue. Registration starts now. You can send an email to gracefamilyadult at gmail.com. And we're brought to you by the um, Single Parent University, where you can contact them for information. Um, text SPU at 71441, or you can give them a call. Again, that's a Single Parent University. Um, so thank you, um, everyone. Hey, Dr. Bryant, let's talk with you, your lady in red. 
I'm black. I'm my one of my more favorite glasses that you wear, your, <laughs> your red frame glasses. How you doing? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I don't hear myself. Um, that's probably because you're not speaking into the mic. Can I say it again? Good evening, everyone. How are you all on this wonderful rainy evening? All right. What, what, what's wrong with you fixing my mic? Yo, yo fix your me? mic. Take your mic and put it closer to you, right? And stop jumping back from the mic when the mic comes, right? Because nobody can hear you Good when the mic is down. Good evening, John. How I, are you? I know you're leaning all the way forward when you don't have to be just because. Look, look, Dr. Say, Brian, Dr. Brian, what's going on? Right? She's afraid of the mic. She's afraid of the mic. She's afraid of the mic. Well on, doctor. What's going on? Take yourself off mute, man. What are you doing in the car? Put you on mute. You, you, it's your time to talk. Well, it's called some of us have to work, you know. We, I, I don't have the luxury of just being in the studio this evening, you know. You been in the studio. I would love to be in the last of you today. Right. Okay, listen here, Tommy. We ain't got no job. What are you talking about? We ain't got no job. Ha, ha, come by. Hey, John, I'm up with you. What's up, like that. My, my mom says to sell me um, $60. I'm stuck so your mother needs what? My mother says she has a prayer breakfast in April, but so she's looking for three tickets from you and two from Dr. Tell your mother, not a problem, man. For your mother, anything, man. Right, I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell Pastor Llewellyn and Minister Llewellyn. Tell my mom said to send her some money. I'm just for your mom. mother, my mom anything, my friend. Anything yeah. for your mother, man. Notice Dr. Bryant didn't say the same thing, All right? But I'm just telling you, my mom said it. She's watching. How much are the tickets? Uh, twenty dollars each. Right. Twenty dollars for what? Uh, it's a prayer breakfast. Is uh, so she's looking. When is when is April? But it's gonna be in Georgia. She's just looking. I know you're not going down to Georgia. So April twenty sixth. The twenty sixth of what? March? Uh, of April. It's a Saturday. I think April twenty sixth. Yeah, right? right. Definitely. All right. I, I I'll tell my mom that you said. Definitely. I'm telling. You, I'm telling you, I, tell I'll buy a couple of tickets. So, tell I'll buy a couple of tickets. Yeah. I I I I'm just telling you. Right, straight up. Um. I don't hear Dr. Bryant say she buy a couple of tickets either, but I'm mom. Dr. Bryant, I told, Bryan, don't to buy a ticket. Mom, I'm about I told to them go. on here and silent Dr. Bryant. Silent is consent nowadays. Silent means consent. Dr. Bryant, you heard that? Silent means you know. At the, the number one complaint my guests, my my audience have about Dr. Bryant is that she just remains silent on certain things. Like she said, they go, and they can't get her to speak on topics that she's just not interested in. Right, we, do, we can't get her to do that. So, John, how do we get her to talk on topics that she's just not interested? In? Just talk to her, her part if she wants to. How do we get her to do that? A silence speaks for itself, my friend. No, the silence just means I'm just not interested in this topic and let's move on. No, topic. I don't think that's what it means. So, what does it mean? You tell me what you think it means because she's not going to say it. So, what do you think it means? <laughs> Look, Dr. Brian, silence is golden. Yo, she might if you, yeah, take yeah, that, yeah, Roderick. Yeah, Dr. Sanson, if you see the look coming out of these beautiful glasses she got here, you couldn't believe that it's this woman who's sitting next to me who looks gorgeous, right? You couldn't believe the look. You know how they say in the West Indies, for a look could kill? You, the other one here, right here. Look, she's still up on me. It was the same thing that happened to Haiti with these looks. I'm telling you, man. So, uh, how was your week? You yeah. know, Doctor Doctor Bryant. It, it reminds me of of one of those uh, one of those parents who are so quiet, and the next thing you know, boy, they pull off their shoe or get that yep. belt and start hitting you in the head with it. You know, cuckoo, 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 cuckoo. That's a right. Look <laughs> exactly. right. at yo. I'm telling you, I need your listen here, Doctor Samson. I. I am not out in my car, so I don't know if the slap from the right hand is coming. Hey, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something as you say that, John. About 25 years ago, I'm doing a parent-teachers conference. And in the parent-teachers conference, we, I told the parent that your child was cursing um, in my classroom. John, without looking, the parent took a right hand. Without looking, it's like she knew exactly where the upper lip and the bottom lips were. <laughs> when she turned around and slapped Nikisha, boom! One time for Nikisha. 
food seller to cost no money in the class. So, what what, what numbers are we up to now? Um, Roger, that and, and that is what is missing from our schools. Yeah. Right see again see what i'm saying you see what i'm saying her damn moving right along i hope you don't tell our guests moving right along then you're moving right along moving right along so what's going on john a couple of things um a couple of people in the hospital at the high what's going on, of bro? you ask me what's going on and you start talking man let me tell <laughs> yeah. you what's going on bro. No, I, I, just thought I, I just thought i'd start you off mitch mcconnell and what's the fetterman both of them Hospitalized. I thought you know you like government stuff. Um, Mitch McConnell um, was uh, hospitalized, and Fetterman, the, the the guy who the the senator who who had the stroke, who had the stroke um, out there from Pennsylvania. Fetterman, Fetter, Fetterman from Pennsylvania. Yeah. So he went in for depression, and uh, Mitch McConnell uh, for illness. So the highest level of government. Um, and I, I said. Um, Joanne, um, what is it, Feinstein also? Yes, yes, yes. You know, so, you know, that's... that's but, you, but you know what's interesting is that um, we better start really looking at Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis is worse than Donald Trump. Mm. I hope everybody realizes that I prefer to have Donald Trump than Ron DeSantis. I tell you, you that. Believe, can you believe that, that somebody actually said that out loud? Can you believe that? Somebody actually said, I rather. But here's my thing, John. Wait, elaborate um, why you say he's worse, though. I was going to ask the same question because he got elected twice. Twice. And the second time he got elected down there in Florida. On his own. Right. No, not on his own. The most, yes, the margin of victory. The margin of the points that he won by was ridiculous. Yeah. Ron DeSantis is very scary. Is. His ideology is extremely suspect. Very suspect. Donald Trump, at least you know who he is, and he tells you what he's going to do. Ron DeSantis is totally different. Mm -hmm. This whole I thing now, you not say gay or whatever it is. That's just, and then the, the whole issue with woke, and then you know this guy is he, he's a scary, scary figure. And also about we, we not teaching that. Not teaching about history, erasing history. He's all about that. That it has anything to do with slavery, anything to do with negativity. He wants, you know, he doesn't want it taught. And the sad thing with that is some of the textbook companies have been adhering to his request. So we're bending and shaping. Um, our children's future based on someone's ideology, and that's a problem. You know, you, you know, um, I, I, I'm going to go and say this, right? Um, people sometimes, one of the main issues of people, especially on um, a week, on a week, white people, Asian people, black people, Caribbean people. One of the things is that, I, I said it last week and I'm gonna say it again. You learn from the past, you live into the present and prepare for the future. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna keep saying that along with some other sayings. And why this saying is important is that people keep saying the past is the past, let it live or let it lie. You cannot, con we cannot continue doing this, John, uh, um, uh, Dr. Sampson, Dr. Bryant. We can't continue doing it if the repetition is coming. Because mm -hmm. that's how you're going to get the Jim Crow laws into play. You're going to, blacks, whites, 
certain people are going to forget the history and the excuses or you don't need to learn this anymore but a lot of times people you, you know you have, history is when you look in the history books it's a white man's history it's an enslaved history and about the beauty of the united states and as far as i know right as far as i know mm -hmm. right history the the, the 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 pure history of the united states had its negative and its positive so that's a problem for me like that we really need to work on that so i don't i'm, and I'm, that's I'm not why sure education is very important you're getting history from all over every perspective it's not just a one size fit all but you're learning from everything right um yeah and and to me that that's uh the to me that's a problem right um bill maher had both had a, a comparison piece about the, the the two uh elected officials right the two elected officials and what they you know right and and john you spoke about something else too about his foreign policy and you just actually shocked as a former Navy SEAL, right, um, and and some of the things he's saying, but it's kind of scary to see how far right America is going because he's further right than Trump. John, you there? Can you hear me? He's definitely further right than Trump. Yeah, uh, and some of the issues. Oh, uh, you know, some more exciting news. The NCAA is going on. How are your brackets doing? This is one of those moments in Dr. Brian's silence. So you and I will just have a conversation. I practice doing. You John? That's why he's ignoring you. He's, he's muted, so he's going back and forth. Okay. You know what I'm a little disturbed about? What? St. Francis decided to get rid of their um St. Francis, which one? College. No, there are two. There's one in Pennsylvania, there's one with Dr. The one no, the one in New York. Athletic programs. Yeah, I, I I don't understand. How do you get to NCAA and then you get rid of everything? So. So wait. So the entire. So they decide to get rid of the whole entire athletic program. That doesn't make sense. Why? 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 One, they said after post pandemic, right. um, they're losing money. Well, well, a lot of people are, but also a lot of people go to college to see it. Or to play. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so what what happens with those individuals um, who, um, what happened to all those students, athletes? What happened to them? I don't know. That's a good question. Good question. Did it, John, did they make any, any, um, assessment as to what they're going to do with those student athletes what you said roger what 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 assessment did they make about the student athletes now that um now that they've they got, got to disband the program i don't i don't i don't really know i really don't know and that's a problem if you went to school on like an athletic scholarship, what would happen? This is um, exciting here. I'm just looking at the brackets. A couple of major upsets that I see so far. On the number three seed, Baylor lost to Creighton uh, in the round of 32. Princeton is in the Sweet 16. They beat number two, Missouri. So number number seven, Missouri. So they're in the round of, th of 16. Um, yeah, Florida Atlantic. The number 10 seed beat number one Purdue. FDU beat Purdue. Wow. Number 16 seed beat the number one seed and knocked them out of the tournament. All right. And Florida Atlantic, you know, move on. Duke lost to Tennessee. I'm, you know, some some really good upsets here. Kentucky really lost good. to Kansas State. It's not an upset, but you know, you look at Kentucky. Um, Michigan State beat number two Marquette. To go to <laughs> Sweet 16. Houston is still in. Miami. 
Uh, Miami beat Indiana. I mean, that's not a major upset there. That's, that's expected. And then you have uh, Xavier beat Pitt. So that's a, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, Texas Penn State lost. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's uh, Dr. Bryant's alma mater. Yeah. Kansas lost to UConn. UConn is in the is in the Sweet 16 as well. They're back to the Sweet 16. Gonzaga is in. That's nice. They're, 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 you know, um, John Gonzaga has become a perennial, um, a perennial uh, um, basketball powerhouse. Yes, basketball powerhouse in the last uh, 15 years. So they're back uh, as well. Um, you know, that's kind of exciting. What else do we have uh, quickly to talk about before our guests come on? We have, like I said, and speaking of powerhouse, our three guests today are a bunch of powerhouse. What do you want to talk about? One topic you want to talk about real fast, um, Dr. Barney, before something short. What do you want to talk about before Andre comes back with a commercial and bring our guest on? We can also talk about. I can't about... hear you. You got to speak up. Okay. You and this mic thing. No, it's your mic. We it's not my mic. mic. I, can, I can hear loud and clear through my <laughs> mic. It's you who too far from your mic. You know what I want to talk about? I want to talk about um, the 16-year-old. What 16-year-old? Who actually, who ended up crashing. Oh, in, um, yeah. On the highway. And um, just those poor innocent babies who were in the car with them. So this is where we have to be more vigilant. And where we keep our keys, and if your child, first of all, your child should not be on the highway with their siblings uh, driving because they don't have a license. Second of all, you know, they're not supposed to be in a car with minors, but just overall, please be more mindful of how you protect your kids. Keep the keys away, keep the car, the car keys away from the kids because a lot of kids want to experiment, and unfortunately, Sometimes it becomes deadly. So, I I I I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, we 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 we're making a judgment call, right? How do we know the parents were not aware that he was driving the car? A sixteen-year-old, you would leave your your kids. My son was sixteen years old. Was driving his brothers. His brothers. Okay. And him. Oh. Okay. At sixteen. Okay. My son. At but 16. you know that's illegal, right? No, he, he had a license. He had a permit and he had a license. My son. My son could have driven from he was 10 years old because I taught him how to drive and his mother and I both taught them how to drive from 10. So they knew how to drive. Um, okay, that, don't say that. I'm not, I'm saying it out loud. I've been driving since I was 12. Now, how old were you started driving? Well, how old what? How old what? How old were you when you started driving? When I started what? Driving. Oh, I think it was 18 or 19. Okay. Legal age. Yeah. Legal age. Right. Um, yeah, but I'm saying when I got my license, I was, tw I was 20 when I got my license. Right. I was 20 years old when I got my license. I was, I started driving. My father started teaching me how to drive. And it was chemo day? Yes. Okay. Today's chemo day. Um, from when I was 10 years old, and then I officially started driving from when I was 15, right? So I was, I was 15 years old when I started driving. And then I got my permit when I was legally able to get a permit. Um, and then I got my license at 20, right? Uh, a couple of weeks before my 21st birthday, when I officially got my license. It doesn't mean that you cannot drive. That I think, means you cannot drive. No, no. Yes. Yeah, per, I, 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 that means no, that, that to if me, you are driving no. on the highway, you should not be driving alone. First of all, you're 16 years old. You should not be That's driving not alone. That's not true either. That is true. That is not true. I, and I, I want to make sure I say this out loud, out there. I am in no way, shape, or form, right? I'm in no way, shape, or form endorsing unsupervised right unsupervised driving i'm in no way shape or form endorsing that however what i'm also saying is not because you have and and i think there's a difference right so some people say because it's legal it's okay right i have a license so 
so therefore so therefore um because you have a license mean you can drive the hell you can right the hell you can because you have a lot of people okay. nowadays still Roger, have license, you can't drive. Roger, yes. you're right but a, a minor should not be driving alone their siblings but we're gonna well, move on again who was in the car I, I, the there was siblings, no adults right i mean my my 16 year my 16 and a half year son was okay. a very good driver thank very you good. so much um um so let's go to commercial um ladies and gentlemen we are brought to you by the single parent university um where you can get assistance with your children uh even with yourself even if, if, if sometimes you even plan to become single parent and um you know so you can get personal development mindful parenting support seminar finance management financial management nutritional wellness for free uh session child care um a social support hub uh resume cover letter writing career exploration and legal assistant please call 646-779-6767 or text sbu to 71441 before we're going to guess i want to make a correction um i was i was called on something that i said last week and it was just misinterpreted i felt it was misinterpreted and dr bryant did address the subject and i thought i did as well last week when i was talking about the woman who killed her children i would in no way shape or form was dismissing mental health because mental health is very important the conversation i was having was should the government stop a per wait, wait i'm not doing it for discussion i'm just bringing it up should the government it was a, it was a question should the government stop an individual from having children knowing that there's issues of mental health violence and the like and can predict certain incidents that might happen not that they should not address the mental health of the parent post childhood or uh, post giving birth that's that that's that's the whole conversation one had nothing to do with the other so um i just want to make sure i clarify that because you know clarify, but okay we're moving right along because the thing is what you're saying don't even go there so we want to bring our guests on yes we do Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> hello. Why, why, why are you guys laughing? Because I'm in trouble. <laughs> is, is it, look, I, I, I'm surrounded by five doctors. Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm surrounded by five doctors. But I, 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 I kind of want to open up the camera, but I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't. Do I won't, not I won't. entertain. I will not. Because I'm I will in the not. studio I will live. not. I will not. <laughs> the only thing I'm saying. Right, not open up. There's there there are two points, and the, your points wait, are irrelevant. No, there are two points. There's the, the, it, it, there is this, and uh, about pre. Wait, there's this about preconception, and then there's this about postconception. Okay, there That's is the moving on the long. Right, exactly. All right, so, um, Dr. Tamika Francis. Yes. Doctor, I want to make sure I pronounce all the names right. Dr. Joanna <laughs> David uh, Tramatano. Italiana? Yeah, my husband, yes. <laughs> and, and Dr. Susie Metzger. Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to have you on today. Um, and welcome to the show. Um, Thank you. Uh, our co host, Dr. Sampson is having some difficulty with. Um, usually, when you when we're not in the studio, it's sometimes extremely difficult, and you go through these things. So we apologize. So he might be in and out. So we apologize for that. Welcome to the Village Radio Talk Show. I'm Roger Kelly. I am your host. Uh, to my left is Dr. Uh, Joanne. Uh, I was about to call her Joanne Sampson. <laughs> Joanne Bryant. Um, you know, I please don't mind me. Sometimes I screw these things up, and it, probably there's a there's a um, a laser 
right in my head right now for making that little error in my head, but I thought I'd bring that up. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. Good evening, ladies. Thank Good you evening. for joining us. We're yeah. excited to have you on. Very, very excited. So you know what? We're going to start by my favorite word. Please introduce yourself to our listeners and whoever can start first. Let's we'll start with you, Dr. Francis. Okay, so hello. Good evening to everyone. My name is Dr. Tamika Francis, and I am the proud dean of the School of Education. <laughs> and I am very excited to be a part of the show this evening. I do want to say that I come with 23 years of education behind me in the New York City Department of Education. I've been a teacher, an assistant principal, and a principal. I had the pleasure of meeting Johanna uh, Tramontano at um, Teaching Matters, which is where I was as a, a consultant. Um, from there, I uh, went to the New York State Education Department on my last day of being there. It was the first day of Dr. Johane Bryant coming on at the state level, and it was a pleasure to get to meet you. And as a result, I'm able to be here today. Um, and from leaving there, I was able to go straight into becoming the Dean of the School of Education. Um, um, again, it's such a pleasure to be able to be a part of this show this evening. And I do want to say I have two outstanding directors that are going to be able to um, introduce themselves as well. <laughs> you know, before you say anything else, I, I, I'm very upset with all three of you. I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> look, at, look at Dr. Joanne and look at me. Like, what is he talking about? I'm just meeting him. <laughs> you, go, you get on the air and Dr. Joanna... And Dr. Susie, they're going to tell me the same thing. And it's going to make me very angry. You're going to tell me you have 23 years of service and you look like you're 22. I'm, how does, I mean, seriously, I know you're both going to I'm very upset. I'm, I'm, I'm very, 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 very upset about that. I mean, when, you, when you guys start telling me that, I'm angry. I'm angry. I'm just upset. I just thought I'd share that. Uh, you know, Thank you for the compliment. I'm, not a problem. Who, who are you introducing I'll next? take it. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next on our uh, agenda? Who want to go in there? Yeah, I'll jump in. My name is Dr. Susie Metcher. I spent most of my career in the New York City school systems. I was about 12 years as a classroom uh, teacher and then moved to administration and realized I did not love administration and started to do some adjuncting on the side uh, and eventually which led me to Monroe College. And this is my eighth year there. Um, and I am the chair of the undergraduate program as well as one of the professors and clinical supervisors of the program. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Dr. Joanna Tramatano. Do you use both David Tramatano or you use one of them? I, I do now. I do now. I, I changed my name back to adding my maiden name when I defended my dissertation uh, recently. Oh, wow. I wanted to honor my father's memory and, and put back my maiden name. So thank you so much for having me. Um, it's an absolute pleasure. So I've also been in education 23 years. 9-11 was my first week teaching. So I... Oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> yes. Hey, <Peter. laughs> Go ahead, doctor. Finish up. You're saying you're frozen, Dr. Tramatano? Is she frozen? She looks frozen. Yeah, I think she got frozen. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, generally speaking, if you get sometimes because of the Wi Fi, you guys might get frozen and stuff. So just if that were to happen to any of you, just log off and um, log back on. Are you back, Dr. Dr. Tramatano? David, David Tramatano, are you back? Mm. Uh, she's not back. So just, why don't you can just text her and tell her to mm -hmm. log off and log on. Or Andre, can you do that? Do you have their, all their numbers? Yes. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. There she is. Oh, she went off just now. Yeah, she went off, so she, she should be back shortly. So um, very exciting. Uh, myself, I, 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 I was... Uh, I retired as an assistant principal um, yeah. with the New York City Department of Education. My background uh, is uh, as an, I was a Spanish teacher um, prior to being becoming um, going into the areas of student culture, student life, uh, school discipline, um, and 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 later on, um, I met actually met Dr. Bryan when I was one of the persons that was heading the Dream Program 
um, are part of the leadership team for the Dream Progress Public Matter Statement uh, back uh, a number of years ago. Actually, this is, I think this is year 10 that I, I, I it's about year 10, right? No, I'm not sure. Um, about 10 years ago. 2014 or something like that, I think around that time. Yeah. Um, and so very exciting, um, had some leadership aspirations, but I had to step back uh, from that after I took ill, but I'm still very interested in what is happening with education and congratulations to, um, you know, Dr. Bryan and her elevation to something that I know she was looking forward to, um, to doing. Um, so welcome, welcome, welcome to both of you. Yeah. And as soon as uh, Dr. David Tramatana comes back, we're good. So let's let 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 you're you're the dean of education at yes. um, first of all, this is you, you, you just started uh, yes. within the last I, I think about five months. I, I'm not sure. Yes. I don't remember. October October 31st yes. was my I, first day. Yeah, so <laughs> November, December, January, February, March. So it's five months exactly. Um, tell me some of the things I know right away I'm going off script, right? Mm -hmm. Tell me some of the things that you immediately observed between and, and the Super Bowl. So I'm gonna talk with you first, though, Dr. Francis. So yes. you immediately observed between administratively from the because both of you have administration background mm -hmm. from the DOE and uh, 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 an accredited college slash university, as well as college. Um, tell us what some of the immediate administrative things that you observed that made either your life, that made your life different. Let's not say harder or smarter because you're still working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for me, I want to say that um, a part of my onboarding process for, was for us to meet with um, the president, Mark Jerome. And in that meeting, he actually talked about the history of Monroe College and how it was has been 87 years of, um, of actually doing service for students and families. And he talked about how he was wanting a warm and welcoming learning environment, which was going to be rich and diverse. Um, and in that conversation, I was just looking around the room. I saw the diversity right in the room. I also noticed that when I was actually in the role of Dean and I'm in the school setting, I see the diversity there. And then even as upon when I um, am talking to the students and or even my faculty, everyone is so warm and welcoming and assuring and positive. And I think that's the purpose of um, what you want for a school. You want a college to be a place where it's like home away from home. And I, in the Board of Ed, tried to build that same type of culture within my school settings that I've all, I've worked in. And when I was an adjunct professor at Monroe College, I felt the same way that I was being welcomed. I, I was appreciated. I was valued as a person. And so it made me transition into this position. And now in this position, I feel so excited to know that that's the kind of culture that we're establishing and maintaining. So even today, I had an interview with a student who wanted to become an education major. And as I sat across the table from her, she said to me, even sitting in your lobby, just waiting for the interview, I felt the warmth. And I felt like, oh my gosh, this is so great. She said, I came from a, a um, middle school, high school in which I was um, in a warm and welcoming environment. And here I just felt it already. So beyond what we're going to teach you, beyond, you know, what has to be done in terms of testing and, you know, in order to pass the test, you're going to become a teacher, is showing these young people that we care. And that's the part that I think is most important. And that's the one thing I can see between a DOE versus being here in terms of an administrator is that the students know that they are definitely cared for. So I'm going to go backwards a little. Tell me what actually brought you both into education. 
<laughs> All right, I'll start. And then, of course, then Susie, you can take it. I just want to say what brought me into education, it all started from when I was a little girl. I was three years old and I had my little dolls lined up and I used to play classroom with them as an only child. So it started from that moment. I had a fabulous teacher whom I'll never forget. So many wonderful teachers along the way, put it that way, who nurtured me and cared for me and really um, showed me and my family that I can do it. And I also have a um, very strong family background who also let me know, because I'm coming from a family of educators, who said, you can do it. And then when I got into my career as a teacher, it, especially during my first year, I was like ready to quit. The first year I was crying every single day, <laughs> literally crying every day. <laughs> and my mom was like, uh, is this a profession for you? Do you really want to do this? But I went back the following years thereafter, and I'm telling you, it was so well worth it. I loved every second of it, even though it was tough. It's not an easy thing to go through, but it definitely is invaluable when you're dealing with young people's lives, helping to change the world. You're helping to, you know, be a part of, be a change agent and you're molding their minds and you're developing them. So for me, all of those things made me just have to be submersed in being a teacher and an educator. And today I am so proud to still be a part of that process. All right. That's my answer. <laughs> All right. um, We're gonna go back. Dr. Uh, Dr. David Tramatano, yeah. um, the two questions on the table. One is- A what, little what, about herself, because she did not get to finish. So you're gonna continue to introduce yourself to our listeners and we're excited to hear. Right, and the second one is your path. Well, the other one is the difference between what you see as the administrative role, difference between the DOE and, and we don't want to, we just want to hear like the difference, like the, the feel that, 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 cause we know we still work and we don't want you to say anything that plus your boss is on the line, right? So just, <laughs> just, just about those two things, um, the, the path and how you, the difference that you see administratively from the administrative perspective. So I think uh, Susan Metz, Metz, uh, Metzger is next, and then Dr. David Trump time. Sure, yeah. My path to education was a little different than Dr. Francis. I was trying to actually avoid it at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> a long line of teachers, and my oldest sister and her husband are both educators, and my other sister is a social worker in a school, and I was like, I'm not doing that. Um, but I found as I entered college and pursued a very different path in communications, all of my jobs outside always worked with children. They kept drawing me back in. So eventually my sophomore year, I was like, yep, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I could avoid it as much as I want, right? But I had a calling that I really need to work with children. Um, and I remember speaking to my brother-in-law about that change. And he's in finance, which is where I was thinking I may go. And said, you know, I just get to move numbers all day long. You get to change lives. So follow follow what you're passionate about. And I, I remind our students of that, right? Teaching is really hard. Yes, you may not be making the same dollar amount as some of your peers in the business world, but you get to change a life every single day. And that's pretty priceless. Um, so that's what kept me in it for 20 years now and then keeps me going even further. Um, to answer your second part, uh, as Dr. Francis said, we are an all hands on deck college. I mean, I constantly tell my students we're full service providers. We're not just helping them with their academics, we're supporting them with social emotional skills, you know, navigating how to talk to their families, professionalism. So they know our door is always open. And let me tell you, they're always filling up our offices, right? <laughs> at any time there's at least one if not a handful of students um, because they know it's an open door policy and they can come to us whatever they need um, and I think that's everyone at the college where in the DOE that may have not always been the case right there are those few teachers who went above and beyond and I connected with them but you may not see that in all schools in all classrooms where across Monroe College from our advisors all the way up to the president everybody is there to make sure our students are successful however we need to get them there. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. That, you know that that, mm -hmm. that is that is a, a beautiful thing. I think is Dr. Samson. No, he's not. So, the next question taken away by Dr. Barnes. No, Dr. Joanna. Oh, she has... did. I'm no. sorry. Hi. I, I'm not used to having three guests at one time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So so sorry. I got I I lost uh, Wi-Fi. Like the whole house lost Wi-Fi temporarily, oh, wow. but I'm back on. So yeah. um, thank you so much. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, uh, so my pathway has always been education. So um, 
to, to, to back up, um, I've served as a teacher, a literacy coach, assistant principal, and eventually director of a whole city for ELA, social studies, and um, Title I. So I, I was responsible for funding for um, a, a large district. And um, I love, and then became a consultant. And I'm really passionate about pre and in service teacher education. Like being able to support the next generation of teachers is really my why and something I'm very passionate about. Um, and my why stems from being a, an immigrant to this country, a first generation student, um, right. coming from a multilingual home, knowing what it's like um, on a number of levels to, you know, to, to, to have socioeconomic, you know, challenges and, and move forward and to be the first to go graduate college. And so for me, um, you know, for me, I always saw education as that key. Um, you know, my parents worked many jobs and they, you know, it was, it was a long path coming to this country. Um, and so for me, like my passion is just helping other students to achieve their dreams, right. To, to fulfill their dreams, to reach their, their highest potential. Um, and everyone stated everything that we, you know, we really su super believe in. We have an open door policy, we work with our students intensively on every front. And for me, I loved being an administrator. Um, I didn't love all the paperwork. Um, it has to be done. But for me, um, coming in every day and knowing that I'm helping my students to become that next generation of teacher, that best teacher that you know is going to meet so many students' needs is just so fulfilling. That's so true. Where are you from? Where is your family from? From France, actually. I was born in oh, France. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, Dr. Tamika. Wait, 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 wait. You yeah. just missed that. I thought you were going to okay. you... parler français avec elle. On peut parler français? Oui. Ah, oui. Elle parle français. Je ne parle pas français. Je parle un petit peu français. Je, je ah, parle vous espagnol. Vous parlez très bien français. Oui, je parle espagnol. Je parle espagnol. <laughs> Dr. Francis, are you from, uh, what's your background? And also Dr. Susan. Um, my family is from Barbados. We were, I'm coming from Barbados. I was oh. born and raised here and um, intend to one day go back to Barbados and fulfill the rest of my life. <laughs> By the oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, 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 all talk, all talk, all talk, all talk. Uh, one day I would like to go back to Jamaica and fulfill the rest of my life too. I don't know about that. <laughs> nah, for real, I'm um, doing it. I'm going. We lost Dr. Suze. She has Wi-Fi issue now. Look at that. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah. so this is great, right? So we have a French. We have a Bayesian, we have a Jamaican, we have a Haitian, and we have a Guyanese. Oh, wow. Who's Haitian? Ooh. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's right. great. Yeah. Dr. Sampson. Sampson. Oh. Dr. Listen to that. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Dr. Sampson's a Guyanese. Mm. Okay. Uh, Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Nice, nice enclave right of, uh, of diversity. Things. Diversity. Wow. Um, so let's get right to some of the. Wait, 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 wait. Yes. Before you get to right, because you you just shoot right into. Can you tell us where Monroe College is located? Where um, let's let's do that. Where can we find Monroe College? Tell us about your population. Let's do that. Okay, so Monroe College, we have three locations. One is in Bronx, and one is in New Rochelle, and the third one is in Saint Lucia. Right. And so we're excited to be able to have three locations. And um, the one that's in, in the Bronx is at, is on Jerome Avenue, which is right there in the middle of the, I guess, sort of to the, of the Bronx. Um, there's also the New Rochelle campus. And that campus is beautiful and a gorgeous um, campus to visit. And it also has dorming. And then this the St. Lucia's campus. St. Lucia campus is also is wonderful as well. And um, we also want to say, if you, you ask the question in regards to the population of our students, majority of our students are coming from either um, African-American descent or either uh, from Hispanic culture. Um, and we have others 
quite a few other populations within our school, but predominantly those are the two that are um, reflective of the students that we have currently. It, it, do you do dormant or is it uh, all uh, uh, commuters? Well, students can dorm, and the dorm is um, at the New Rochelle campus, which is about 20 minutes from the Bronx campus. And so what happens is they do have a shuttle bus that can bring the students from the New Rochelle campus to Bronx or from Bronx back to New Rochelle, either way. And um, currently, our students who are in the school of education, some of them do actually dorm, and some are actually living at home still. Oh, that's cool. Dr. Mm -hmm. Susie's oh, Dr. Susie's back on. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, uh, Dr. Susie, welcome, welcome I, back. Well, um, <laughs> so, so you had what? What is that word called? Like a, a communicable, unfortunate, negative communicable disease, right? So it went from Dr. Joanna to um, Dr. Susie. Uh, fortunately, the, the Wi-Fi. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, interesting uh, comment. A uh, couple of things. One. Um, I guess I want to get some of the preliminary, not the questions that we have on paper, but some of the preliminary things. One, um, you offer financial aid to students if, if yes. we're qualified. Is it a match? Um, is it a match? Uh, what do you do about loans? A lot of, okay, so this is why I'm asking the question. So as former persons that deal with college component for students, a lot of parents don't know Okay, so my comment to a parent is apply to a school, get the package before you say I can't afford to to to, to go to the school. Um, Dr. Susie, since you didn't get a chance to speak before, why would you agree or would you dispel that comment? Yeah, I think we ha you have to make smart decisions at the age of 18, right? Because if you're getting yourself deep with a lot of loans, that's just going to continue and continue through your lifetime. Um, what we're really excited about with our program, specifically the School of Education, is that we are awarded a huge grant through My Brother's Keeper and New York State uh, that provides free full tuition to many of our students who qualify for that grant. It's about 85% of our students receive that. So they'll completely graduate debt-free. Um, uh, with, with zero debt, which is amazing for them. And then they'll also get a lot of other benefits where they get paired with a faculty mentor through the grant. They'll get extra workshops uh, to support them with the certification exam, social emotional skills, everything in between. Um, so, you know, my nephew now is applying to be colleges starting and I created an Excel sheet from him. And I'm like, we got to look at the numbers. Yes, I know you want to go here, but where's that money? Because you're the one paying the bills and you want to start a job and have that money in your pocket and not somebody else's. So I think of informing our students in high school about really what that accountability would mean to pay back loans because they just think it's magic money, right? And we really need to inform them what's gonna, that going to look like in 5, 10, 20 years when you have to start to pay that back. Financial literacy. Do me a favor, uh, Dr. Sue. There's something on your, oh, that at your left side of your screen that's blocking your view. Oh. Wrong okay. way, wrong way. No, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's on, it's on the right computer. side. It's on our computer. Yeah. It's your computer. Um, yeah, just I'll get <laughs> Like, you know how you block the camera? Mm -hmm. I love it. And over your yeah, right shoulder. Your, yeah, I'm sorry. It's over your left shoulder. Your left shoulder. Unless I'm I know. Wrong. I, I'm moving it. It's, it's staying there. So everything's okay. Right. All right. Not a problem. Not a problem. Nope. Um, so. Financial literacy. Thank you for explaining yep. the importance of if you're making a decision to be wise in regards to that. Now, I have a couple of friends who might not be sure on what to do um what I, I guess overall please tell me more about your education program because there's many education programs but tell me about your education program at monroe college a little bit more well one of the first things i would like to say is that we have two programs one we have is our early childhood um, education program, which is where you would attain a bachelor's degree and we have a childhood education program as well. Um, the other program is for our master's program, which is the childhood urban education and urban special education program. So there's like four programs in all, but 
you know, a majors that students can choose, put it that way, um, undergrad and bachelors. Um, we have um, Dr. Susie Metcher, who's in charge and the director of the Early Childhood Program. And then um, we have Dr. Johanna Tramontano, who's in charge of the uh, master's program. So I'm going to let both of them take the turn to go ahead and speak about each of their programs. But um, before they begin, I do want to say that they are dedicated, strong women <laughs> who have really done a phenomenal job with making the program a success. And I know that um, the previous dean that we had, Dr. Ann Lillis, and also uh, Dr. Cardi, our supervisor, has done a fabulous job at creating our school of education. So yes, go ahead, Dr. Metcher. <laughs> Sure, yeah, so I can speak briefly about the undergrad program. Um, first thing to know is we're clinically rich, right? So from freshman year, right when they enter college with us, we place them in schools. We think that's important because we want to build, right, the, the theory to practice connection that's often lacking through many other school of education programs. And two, we want to make sure they like working with children, right? And they like being in that's schools. True. And we don't want to wait till junior or senior year, like many of us went through in our undergrads, to put them in schools. We want them to know that immediately. Um, and then, you know, our classes are very different. When we interview uh, the undergrad students, Dr. Franson are like, be prepared. You don't sit still in our classes, right? We're not standing at a podium and lecturing to you at all. Our classes involve movement, small group, games, centers, activities, anchor charts, everything in between, because we really want to model the actual practices our teachers, future teachers are going to use in the field. Um, so they're as interactive as possible, which I know is very different than my college experiences both at the undergrad and graduate and doctoral levels, which were lecture based. Um, and then, you know, that piece we keep coming back to, our environment's a very different kind of school, right? We know each of our students their families, their backgrounds, their challenges, their needs academically, socially, um, which in many schools, you're just a number, right? Your name or a number on the roster. That's very different at Monroe as a whole and really in our program, where even today in class, one of the students said, we're a family in here. And that's how we look at it, right? All of us are part of a 67 person family at the undergrad level. Um, and I think that really makes us unique and special. And I would also like to add that also the, um, the students graduate in three years. So it's not a four-year program. You actually can go through this program within three years because we have three semesters versus four, which is an awesome thing. Um, I also want to say that we have um, 63 credits in liberal arts and 57 in education. So that would be another way in which we are able to get our students through quickly. Um, and... The other thing is that while when you come in into um, the bachelor's program, you're starting right away in field work. So you're going out into the field. You're going to be working alongside classroom teachers and you're learning how to be a teacher immediately. Um, I think that also is really great. And we're um, going back to the point of teaching our students about professionalism. We're teaching them about curriculum. We're teaching them about all of these great things so that they can actually implement them in the classrooms. And then the last thing that's really important is that when they graduate within those three years, then they will be able to say that they've finished those exams that need to be taken in order to be able to be teachers. And that's the goal. So we're pushing the students by giving them, you know, opportunities to to go out and take those exams. We even give a voucher for the exam so that we don't have to have our students be charged to take those exams. And then once they complete those exams, then we're like, yes, now it's time for graduation. You cross the stage and now you're ready to make 60 to $70,000 a year. So that's really the ultimate goal of how we're trying to push our students in the bachelor's program. So um, saying that, that is, that's actually very, very important. So the that fail will three, right away. Three yes. questions mm -hmm. related to that. One, when do they take the exams? That's A. Um, um, what year into the program? Uh, what, the, two, is there a summer component to that to complete the three-year process? And the third question is, is there a direct relationship with the Department of Education or any other school district, for that matter, because you're up there in Rock in um, the Bronx, in uh, New, Rochelle. New Rochelle, which mm -hmm. is like Westchester, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that area, or is it a state like so? You know, state affiliation to help to place 
um, you know, you create an atmosphere for them to apply for an internship application for school to school district to help with placement. I mean, and again, I, I'm sure when you met with Andre, they told that sometimes the conversation goes exactly what's on script and sometimes it doesn't. And this is one of those conversations where it kind of doesn't because I know we have a whole bunch of more questions to ask. you. So those three questions, again, for repeat. So you want to know this where is, are their internships? No, Some of their no. internship or ask the post-graduation? No, no, no. Which one? I want to know, is there a connection for internships, not mm -hmm. when they do internships? That's not, oh, okay. that's not what I said. No, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> I'm asking her that. I'm asking them that because sometimes connection to do internship, leading into gainful employment, is one thing to say, now you have all the qualifications, go be a teacher, go find a job. Is another thing to say, now that I, we have help you to prepare to become a teacher, we're going to send you, we have relationship, this like mm -hmm. career development office, then I'm going to send you to um, like the teaching fellows, right? The teaching fellows yes. find your position. Yep. Does Monroe College does that? The second thing is when do they take these exams like they need to take? Yep. And the last question is, all those are three-year program, is there a summer or winter module entity to the program? Sure, yeah, I could start with the test question. We um, we learned right the hard way when I first entered the program that if we wait till the end, the students, one, are resistant to take them. They're nervous, they're scared. And then two, they may not pass the first time, right? So they have to take it a couple of times. So what we've done since then is build in. Every year they're in our program, they're taking one of the exams. Um, so within the courses that they're taking that year, they're doing little bits of test prep along the way to prepare for that exam. So they'll take one freshman year, they take two, to their junior and sophomore year and then they take the third almost heading into their senior year so it's spread out and that way if they don't pass for whatever reason the first time even through our extra workshops and test prep we can then provide an intervention plan whether it be small group workshops giving them some side of math help through modules things like that um, and that way the goal is by the time they get senior year they've gone through all three tests or uh, four tests rather and uh, have passed them so when they graduate they're fully certified Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And then our, our partnerships, you know, we work with many schools within the Department of Education. Actually, Dr. Francis and I are going in next week to visit another school who contacted us and is interested in partnering with us. Um, also, many schools within Westchester County schools as well. Um, and, you know, our goal is always to get them hired, right? Like I was telling my seniors today, I, I want the job just as much as you want the job for yourself. So, um, you know, many of our charter schools, Dr. Francis, I met a, a principal the other day or high knee teachers he said the three students who are here i'm hiring them for the fall don't let them go anywhere else i want them right Absolutely. because our students are so prepared since our, our department's so clinically rich they want our teachers they know how to give running records and analyze them they know how to use classroom management so when those principals walk by and see one of our field works or student teachers in action they reach out to us and say okay how can we get that person in my school so we have a, a probably what 95 percent rate and my colleagues can chime in of getting students jobs right after they leave we're on the phone calling schools what do you have available we're sending them openings that we know about and our goal is to get them all employed and making 60 plus uh right away as soon as they graduate yeah because we definitely do have a teacher shortage and yep. that is a problem all over the united states yep. so um it's exciting to to hear yes. and to um to, to see the kids getting prepared for this life because we don't need any shortage in the school districts at all I also see that there's a question in regards to internships polls, and it says, where are sites for the internships selected or matched to the students? I do want to say in terms of that, we've had, um, upon my arrival, there were partnerships already in place uh, prior to me coming, which is awesome. Um, and with me being there, I've tried to bring in as, you know a few partnerships myself. Each of us are always scouring and looking for principals who are willing and wanting to open their doors to have um, students come in in terms of matching the student we do take time to match the students to their selected um environments that they want to work in um, most students prefer working in the environment in which they live they want to work where close to where they live so that's what we're pretty much working with um 
I can I know for a fact that Dr. Tramontano knows that there's a student whom we're in right now still thinking, okay, now how do we place this student? Where are we going to place her? She wants one place. We're like, what about this place? So we're going in back and forth in conversation all the time, thinking about how do we make sure that the student is comfortable where they are, as well as, you know, they're going to get the best you know, lesson or learning or experience within the school that they're going to. We want them to be able, both entities to really benefit from the experience. We want the cooperating teacher, the principal, the school community to feel like that the student that was placed is of value to them and that they appreciate having them. So that would be my answer to that question. And as for your last question in regards to um, summertime we have three semesters and our um semesters the spring the spring semester starts in may right <laughs> and it ends in august and so with that said that is where you're ending up thinking that it feels like a whole summer semester honestly and so that's how the semesters go they are in set, uh three semesters instead of four and it is intensive and it's you know a lot of work but it's well worth it in the end i, I see uh, um <laughs> <laughs> a, oh, partnership. a partnership yeah yes. this is a re this is a <laughs> former superintendent so i know that they're actively working so um very uh, nice I'll reach out to you dr Sanita. so dr mejias if you want to leave a contact uh I'll, email. I'll give it to her oh, yeah, i'll give it to okay her. yeah so thank you so much all right excellent excellent um as a matter of fact, well, see, I see that I'm going to text over to a couple of my um, superintendent okay. friends that they should uh, log in because that might be helpful. So, Thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, I'll do that now and see what they say. So here is another one. How are you recruiting your students straight out of high school, schools, GED, grad, or must the student be a high school grad? Um, if not, is there an age cap? Hmm. So, Dr. Tramontano, you want to take this one? I would love for you to also talk about the MAT program. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we we do we do recruit students straight out of high school, but we also we are you know as long as the students meet the the you know academic expectations and you know we're happy to you know it, it really we'll we'll take our students as long as they they meet the criteria whether they're a little bit, you know, older, whether they've been just straight out of high school. Um, and for the master's program, which I, I support, um, we have students who are potentially career changers. And we also have students who are in um, currently in the classroom and have initial certification. So we actually have different pathways that can support students based on their individual needs. Um, so, you know, our, our master's program, our master's in teaching, um, offers an opportunity for, um, so it's a master's in early childhood urban education slash special education, um, which is really amazing and exciting because it, potentially the student could graduate with their initial license in like early childhood education with a, with a, uh, students with disabilities extension, which we know is so needed. We know we need more and more um, highly qualified teachers who can, you know, meet the needs of our students. And so, um, you know, we, we, as long as we have, you know, candidates who have the minimal core requirements as required by state ed in terms of their liberal arts, you know, it, obviously there's an individualized process in looking at the individual transcripts, but we do have career changers. We do have people who are currently serving as like paraprofessionals and want to become teachers. And we really want to support students in meeting their academic goals. I hope I didn't miss anything, Dr. Francis. Yeah, I'm just going to add one more thing, and that there is the um, Career Pathways program that we have, and that um, is one in which we um, students can have a high school equivalency and an associate's degree for adult, adult learners, and it helps them to be able to, you know, submerge themselves into coming into the school the school of education over time. So that's one other way to do it as well for those who are GED, maybe a GED grad or one whom is um, going through that type of a process. Um, that's that 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 is um, excellent news. I'm 
I'm, but I'm here, I'm trying to text to where I say, hey, hey, who do I know as a principal might be interested in a qualified teacher? It's really going through uh, my head, you know, as we speak. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, so if you see my head down, I'm, I'm looking to say, hey, who, how many of these people can I uh, reach out to, reach out to while you guys through? are online? Um, um, John, yeah. do you have a question for our guest? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, my question is, is the academic requirement for those who are entering college. Mm -hmm. And there has been dialogue about those students who are coming from high school to college not meeting the necessary requirements, therefore having to take remedial courses yes. in order to, um, to, 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 I guess, properly enroll in these institutions. And, you know, my question is, is what can your college do in order to, 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 to decrease the number of those students who have to take these remedial courses? Uh, is there a way that there can be a, some sort of partnership with some of these high schools so we can get our students at uh, the level that they need to be? Because as a result of that, you know, it, it basically delayed the process in which they should be graduating from college and, and doing certain things. So that's my, I guess, my statement question. You know, what can uh, the college do to decrease the number of those students who have to take more remedial courses? I guess before college too, right? So as before they enter college, as they're entering college, um, just pre pre college and in college. I I, I just want to add that to your question. Okay, so um, currently what we're doing is we have put in place different. Not so much the pre-college, but I can talk about what happens when you get into the college or, get, or coming to the college. Right before you step into the college, we are doing assessments, which is called a math placer, to try to figure out what level you're on in terms of math. Because math tends to be the, the area that the students struggle the most in based on the data that we wow. put together to figure out how students are passing these tests you know, the state exams that they need to pass in order to become teachers. And so looking at that, we've realized that the math is the area that needs the most work. So once the student comes in and takes that math accuplacer test, then we can then think about, okay, what type of course should you take next to help you to get better at the, the areas that you feel like you're a deficit? And then from there, we go into that. We also have um, for the students who are in our program currently, we've already put um, in place professors who are actually going into looking at what is the test ex exactly looking for, and then how are we making sure that the curriculum that we're providing aligns to that. So that's one other thing that we're doing. In terms of the prior part, like what your question is really specifically asking is what's happening with high schools. That could be our ne a big next step for us would be to go back into the high schools mm -hmm. and support them by asking them, you know, where, how their students are doing. One of the things that we notice for sure is that, especially with the incoming freshmen, there's that COVID gap. You remember? Oh. And so then students fell behind academically. And so now we're trying to play catch up, right? Uh -huh. Two years of a loss. And so in that time, we're, we're bringing in these freshmen and we're like, oh my goodness, we really need to do double time on terms of their math skills in terms of you know socialization their social emotional there's so many pieces that are, are are missing to them and we are providing those services we have so many different um programs within our school that can be of a resource to the students and um, we provide those through their academic advisors and counselors and you know we have um mental health people there who are supporting with mental health. We even have uh, workshops that we're hosting as a school that have come in in terms of um, providing that social emotional help. 
And so that part is there. So we're doing the academic and that together to try to help the students. But like I said before, we need to definitely go back into the high schools even further, like you're mentioning. As a comment, I appreciate that comment and thinking about how do we go back and say to the schools, what can we do to help you to prepare these students to come to us eventually in, co in the college level. And many of the, of the schools are open to it and want it. You know, they're, they're not saying they don't want support because many schools do want support. And how do we get the children to be prepared for career readiness? So I have a superintendent who texts me back uh, yes. a couple of questions and she said what is the partnership please send details and i guess that would be i would need if i send dr bryant uh the contact of uh, uh andre she also asked do you have any information um regarding what the partnership would look like what the what say the partnership again. would look like oh partnership partnership okay so yes um does anyone want to take that one or shall i take it <laughs> yeah sure so Johan and I, uh, part of our job as chairs is to really work on our clinical partnerships. Of course, Dr. Francis is supporting us through that process. So please have them contact us and we'll send them a lot of information. Um, but at the undergrad le level, fieldwork students uh, will come in mostly every Friday when they don't have classes and they'll be there for three or four hours consistently. We make that really clear to our students that if you're saying you're coming 10, 10 to two, that's when you're there because our young students are used to routines and they're expecting you and looking forward to it for you each uh, day. And then our partnerships are one year. So we don't have students bouncing around. We have them in the same classroom from September to June so they can actually grow their responsibilities as they get more comfortable with the teachers and students um, and, and, you know, make a bigger impact, right, instead of just moving like a lot of other colleges will do. And then uh, student teaching happens senior year. So our students are actually in the schools five days a week um, and half days on Tuesday, Thursdays, because they have courses in the afternoon, but they're there the whole school day where they really not become a student teacher. They really become a co-teacher in the classroom um, where they're supporting, you know, students as long beside their cooperating teacher. And then Johan, if you want to chime in about the grad program clinical, feel free. Yeah, so we, at the graduate level, we also are clinically rich. We want our students to not just learn the theory, right? Theory is great, but what does it mean in action? So from the very beginning, we really, um, we have field work opportunities. We work with the individual. So one thing that distinguishes us at the graduate level is we do have some students who are already in classrooms, some students who are career changers, right? I work really, really closely with each individual to make sure that we are meeting those requirements for field work while also supporting their individual needs. And that's a real, that's a realistic thing for a graduate student who may be juggling a full-time job, family responsibilities, and so on and so forth, while also wanting to continue their studies. So I work really closely on an individual level. Um, in some cases, if they're already in a school setting, we may be able to give them those fieldwork opportunities in the school that they're working in, which is why I have to, I communicate very closely with the individual and the schools that they're at. Um, with their principals um, and and making sure that we can we can make this work and the, I always have we have lots of partnerships right so there's always a plan A B and C so we can always we can figure things out and make things work by reaching out to additional partnerships um, so that we can get the students. Um, the experience that they need. Um, I just wanted to also say at the undergraduate level, one thing that I think really distinguishes us is that from the very beginning, like freshman year, we actually have the students already beginning their field work from the That's very awesome. beginning, um, which awesome. I think is important, right? Students mm -hmm. need to know whether they want to be around children, whether right. they enjoy it, but also right. we want them from the beginning to get that experience. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. We're going to head to a commercial in a minute, and then I have some hard questions. <laughs> These are the easy, friendly, uh -oh. welcome on board questions, but, you know, we, we, we have some harder questions for you, too, right? <laughs> um, to, to, uh, to ask. So it's coming right up. Uh, this is thank you, everyone, for watching, joining, viewing the Village Radio Talk Show. I'm Roger Daly, I'm your host with Dr. Joanne Bryant. To my left, Dr. Sampson, um, who's on. Uh, I guess he's you know driving, have some internet issues. Uh, welcome. So we also brought you, we have a parent guardian forum on uh, 
April 1st, Saturday, April 1st, from Next 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. in the afternoon, virtual. Mm -hmm. And uh, on at this forum, we'll be having we have some real good experts talking about uh, mental health. We're talking about guardian skills, parent and guardian skills. We have uh, educational research. workshops, mm -hmm. providing academic resources. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's something. If you have a question. Uh, you will get an answer. So we are the Village Radio Talk Show, and we are in every way supporting the well-being of a child, helping them to stay in school, stay in focus, getting to, as parents providing you additional support. So the Parent Guardian Educational Forum is one opportunity for you to come out with your questions, with your child, with your um, ignorance to anything, or you're well full of knowledge to other things and you bring and share. You can sign up on Eventbrite um, at the Parent Guardian Forum. You can click on the Facebook. If you're on the Facebook, the Village Radio Talk Show Facebook site, if you go to our YouTube station, um, you'll see that you can click on any one of our station at Roger F. Daly uh, on, on Instagram, Dr. Joanne Bryant, Jael Sampson on Facebook or Roger Gaptelli on Facebook as well. So um, welcome again. So if you guys, if, you, if you're on the air, I know I see some, some messages coming in. Some people send me some personal messages. Hi, Auntie Maureen, I see you. I'll make sure I say hello, because if I don't, you're gonna kill me when I talk, to, when I talk tomorrow. Um, so let's start with some of the difficult questions. Our students of color, black and brown, oh boy. boys especially, and girls, but mainly boys, have the highest dropout rate or mm -hmm. lack of completion from college. Talk to us the trends that you see that cause some of these issues. Um, Dr. Brian is like, talk about everybody else. I'm like, no, I'm going to stick to black and brown students because they have not that every other race doesn't have it but the highest rate is black and brown what are some of the trends that you see and then i know dr bryant has a question about mental health because burning through her shoe bottle that's her favorite topic mental health but let's just go to the drop out rate first hmm. okay so um one of the things that I notice as a trend, and I'm coming from an elementary level, right? Because I um, worked only primarily with elementary students, is that black and brown children, especially boys, tend to need activities that are a little bit more engaging, hands on, a little bit more movement. Um, and it has to be um, something that's like capturing their attention and it has to be a quick snapshot. You can't make it into something drawn out long <laughs> that's going to keep them sitting there like a lecture type situation. Anything that's short, quick and in a, in a snapshot for students, um, something that can be engaging for them tends to work better um, and hands on. And the I think what makes it powerful in Monroe College is that, as the ladies have mentioned already, is that we make sure that when we're teaching the students, we're teaching them practical things that they can actually do when they go back to their to schools or to a school setting. Many times we see that men are not ones who are gravitating all the time to education, but we do have quite a few men in our school of education right now that we are so proud to have and we're we're nurturing them and we're supporting them and we're listening to them and we think about what are their needs and we're talking to them and figuring out how do we make sure that what we're providing as an education 
to them meets their needs and keeps them engaged so that they don't say, you know what, I'm out of here. I'm going to take another field. You know what I mean? So again, making it practical, making it something fun, making it not so like long. There's no lecture. We don't do long lectures. What we do is, okay, today we're going to put together, and I've been in the classroom and actually watched it, where the students are putting together um, charts, making classroom charts, or maybe they might be working together in small group, um, having an engaging discussion. They may be talking about, even the other day, I was in Professor Tramontano's class and the students were learning about the compass in which then you learn about what are the personalities of different people and how do you work together as a group. And so class lessons like that are what keeps our young men going. It makes them want to be there. It makes them want to be a part of the classroom. And then also having that listening ear, like I said, there are times when students do have issues or concerns and they come into my office and any one of our offices and they sit down and they share those concerns and we give them an answer that's short, quick, to the point and can get them moving into the next um, phase of whatever their um, goal is for their either lesson or personal life. And so it's just for our black and brown boys, we definitely need to be listening to them. We need to make sure that things are engaging and that they're practical and tangible things that can work for everyday life. That is not something so far disconnected or based on theory that <laughs> causes them not to be interested. So the more interest we have, the better they are and the more stronger they are in wanting to be with us in our schools and in our classrooms. And um, one of the other pieces I think is phenomenal too is that we have our bro my brother's keeper grant, which is allowing us to really focus in on how are we supporting young men? How are we bringing young men in? So the money that's being provided goes towards that. It goes towards the outreach and to, towards thinking about what are the programs or different activities that we can do, whether it be workshops, et cetera, that are going to bring these young men in and let them know that they too can be educators. You know, I, 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 every time I hear my brother's keeper, I never get any credit for this. Obama <laughs> gets all of the credit. But I started my brother's keeper's conversation at Meyer Levin in 2007, before Obama got elected president. Oh, wow. Um, and then my principal at the time, Edward Gentile, uh, and another colleague, Dr. Well, she's an ABD right now in Maryland, Zakia Ali. We had this my, my Brother's Keepers thing at Tilden High School in Brooklyn. Oh, wow. Meyer Levin yes. High School. And then all of a sudden, I hear Barack Obama is talking, and all of a sudden, <laughs> this My Brother's Keepers conference became this this national phenomenon, and I got no credit. <laughs> and then George Patterson now is the DOE person who who does the My Brother, and and so I get no credit for that. But I, I'm glad it's working, even if, even though I don't get no credit. Just just a little gripe of mine. Um, <laughs> um, when I I looked at it in, in importance of black men. While I'm on the subject of black and brown males, why don't you have, why, why do we, why do we migrate? That's not the right word. Why do we run to middle and high school and we steal it from the elementary school? Why do we do that? Dr. Uh, David Tramatano, why do you think we do that? We, 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 we literally run away. I mean, like somebody asked me, like I was even asked if I was willing to be a principal of an elementary school. You're talking about males? Males. Oh. Black males. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Why do we stay away from elementary school when we do, when I know, now that I have two young boys, I mean, I, I have five boys, but um, how important is this to a male figure in mm -hmm. elementary school? Why do we run away? Why? 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 You're asking these ladies? Yes, I'm you asking males. You should ask males, not ladies. No, I'm asking. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm in Jamaica, we say man and mantu. I'm a mantu. I can't answer the question. Well, that's, that's, that's something that you, you know, that's, that's and personal, your male right? friends. Yes. And, uh, okay. so, but, but why? Why do you think that we do that? What's will be your system? Uh -huh. I mean, me, I could tell you why I stayed away from elementary school. Okay, so My reason about, uh -huh. was that um, I'm more rough. Yeah, you and are. I'm not babyish. You're not cuddly, soft and cuddly. Right, right. That's just not me. I'm like, boy, go sit down, and they start crying and run to mommy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That's my experience. Now, 
you might say that's a little bit sexist or male chauvinist or whatever the case is, but that's my experience, right? As a man, I'm like, I'm like, you know how we sit here, my son plays baseball, and mommy would be like, what are you doing? I'd say, yo, man up. Take the hit, get up and start running. My mom, his, my mother, my mother, my wife would go, but he might be hurt. Maybe he needs some ice. Your approach. Not the approach. The it is your approach. No, it's not the approach. It's the expectation. My expectation is toughen up. My, my wife's expectation is he needs an ice pack. He needs a this. He needs a that. That's my, that's my justification. I don't know the psychological, the educational, the factual. I can't explain that. So I don't know if you know any. What, what do you think? And, and we are needed. I know that we are needed in elementary school because I see, I, I, I volunteered in an after school program for, ki for kids. And I noticed how the students, male and female, gravitated to me while I was there. You know, because I'm, I'm retired so and I can't work. So I decided I'm going to volunteer my time. And I saw that. So I'm just wondering. Maybe you have a pitch that you could tell males. I don't know. Maybe that's why I'm saying it. I don't know the answer. So Joanne Mejia has put, we also need to provide opportunities for our young black and brown men to become educated. So what initiatives besides my brother's keepers are available to recruit young black and brown and Hispanic and everybody else to the education field? I, I, all I can say is that I agree with you. I don't know like all the literature in it, but I agree with you on so many levels. I mean, I just think back to Donald Hernandez in 2011. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but he wrote uh, Double Jeopardy, how third grade reading skills and poverty influence like high school graduation, right? Mm -hmm. And the impact, the, his research de demonstrated that the graduation rates for Black and Hispanic students who were not proficient readers in third grade lagged far behind um, those for white students with the same reading skills, right? We know that there are definitely issues that need to be addressed. And I agree with you. I think we need more teachers who are representative of the student population that they are, right, that are in, in their classrooms. We need more of that. So I couldn't agree more with you. I know that in the past, New York City DOE even had a great initiative, right? New York City Men Teach. Um, so, you know, I think it's an important conversation. We're thrilled that we have our students um, that we can't wait, right, to be that next generation and to be that role model. So I think we need more role models in the classroom. And I agree with you, right? W why not elementary space? I wish I had an easy answer. All I know is come learn about our program. We, yeah. we would, you know, welcome you with open arms. Um, and, and I'm on the same page as you. Yeah, one other thing that I just thought about, um, OSI, uh, we, we, we feel a little stronger like if you tell a kid, if all of a sudden, Mr. Daly yelled at me. And then, you know, once they go yelled at me, it's article, what is it, 420 or 420, whichever one of them is not corporal abuse, verbal abuse, whichever one is verbal abuse. You know, you have to go investigate. And we don't want that because, you know, not Black and Latino males, we have the highest incarceration rate per, not, not raw number, but per uh, the, the makeup of the United States is this percentage. Whereas the makeup of jail is this percentage, right? Um, as per population. So we're always afraid of that stigma. So maybe one of the things that we could look at is how do you truly, what do you consider to be foolishness versus real, like we always argue what's really child abuse versus spanking, you know? Uh, you know, I believe in spanking, I don't believe in child abuse. So, you know, there's, you know, there's certain things, the levels are things to look at. Um, so but that's another issue. That's, I, I think there are a couple in. of issues. Cool. Yeah, Mental if health. someone wants to call in to ask a question, you could call 718-841-9980 and ask our guest panelists if they have any questions. You're welcome to do that. And again, if you would like to call in, call 718-841-9980. So I do know that someone had texted me, and I think you answered it, is like second career doing a master's or um just going back into the field of education early childhood they wanted to pursue and that is an opportunity that you mentioned that they can do and apply at monroe i love the fact that it's hands-on right away to see okay this is not for me okay this is for me instead of wasting till your senior year to say oh okay this mm -mm. 
I don't have the patience. I don't, mm -mm, this is not it. And I want you to elaborate a little bit more about the urban part, because I went to Penn State and originally I studied urban early childhood and middle school ed education, but mm -hmm. those practices weren't really urban that I actually said, mm -mm, I'm not doing, why am I paying out of state tuition for something that's not really urban? So what makes your program the urban classification compared to others who mentioned that they have an urban uh, program? Well, I'm going to start out by saying, number one, we're in the heart of the Bronx. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that, is that, is that the BX or, or the Boogie Down? Which one is it? The BX or Boogie Down? Depends or on the day. <laughs> we're that. in the Bronx, okay? And it's so that's the most urban we can get, right, in do. terms of the um, environment. Um, and then also we're thinking about um, the partnerships that we have and the mm -hmm. schools that we work with and the principals that we serve and the students and communities that we serve are all, mostly all in the urban setting. Um, quite a few teachers, um, student teachers are asking for that. They want that. They want to work where they where they um, actually live. And I think that's a, a phenomenal that's idea. Mm -hmm. There are um, students who live in Harlem, for example, and have come to me and are like, okay, so what schools do you have in Harlem? I want to stay right in Harlem. You know. What about Brooklyn? You know, <laughs> I, I, I want to hear about you know, Brooklyn. We need some saying. partnership in Brooklyn or Queens, you know, we need some partnership down there. Would I, your students be willing to actually um, come down to Brooklyn or Queens? I agree. I, I think that would be a good question that we need to ask. I haven't heard anyone just jump at it yet, but to be honest, I would love to see that happen personally. I think that's a great thing. Let's open it up to many different boroughs. Um, we have quite a few schools that I know personally, of course, through having lived and grown up in Brooklyn myself. Mm -hmm. I live in Queens now, so definitely that's an easy thing for us to, you know, make some partnerships possibly with Queens. Mm -hmm. But um, it's just trying to get it to happen. I think there were a couple of students, if I remember, um, Professor Tramontano, that were in Queens, right? They were in Queens. It was just Brooklyn I haven't heard anything about right. much. Yeah. So that's where we were at. So I think that the, getting that urban experience is happening for sure. Um, we want the students to be able to know what it is to be go into one of those New York City public schools and or a charter school and just walk in and feel like, OK, I know what I need to do to make mm -hmm. success for students and not be afraid or have a culture shock when they get there, you know, and just feel like they're disconnected from the community. We want them to feel like they're in an environment where they are part of the community and the students get to see teachers who look like them and the teachers themselves see students right. that look like them and we right. can, and they're able to, you know, grow from that and um, learn also from the cooperating teachers who are there um, in those school settings. I also think that it's important for um, the young people to, who are the children in those schools to know that they too can one day attain that goal of going to college, of being right. able to become a student teacher or be a, a person who's doing field work or a person who becomes a teacher one day, a AP, a principal, a superintendent. Mm -hmm. You just never know. Sky's the limit, right? That and we so have true. We have, um, as a matter of fact, I have one student I could think of on the top of my mind who comes to me all the time. And I, and I, when I first met her, she's a freshman, and I first met her, I was like, oh, it's so wonderful to know you're going to become a teacher soon. And she's like, no, I'm going to be a superintendent. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 love I, love I, I I'm thinking she's in the teaching program because she's trying to be a teacher. And she's like, no, I'm trying to be the superintendent. I, you so, know what? I'm with her. <laughs> Make sure, listen, make sure you, all three of you keep that resume. You never know. You know, I, 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 I was just thinking I asked a question and then I went back to it, right? Wait, I have another question. Wait, wait, I just, no, 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 it's not a question. It's not a question. It's not a question. It's just, no, no, it's not a question. Okay. Just a point. My, I never planned to be a teacher. Never, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm, I, I forgot who said it was. I think it was um, Dr. Metzger who said that she didn't plan. But I remember my fifth grade teacher was Ivanhoe Blake math teacher my favorite teacher in the whole wide world and when i thought about where i was going to work wh how what i looked like as a teacher i thought of ivan Hoblake. so i i it ensured 
that I played sports with the kids, provide club activities. I created an international program for students to take them outside of the city. Um, we, I was in a, a better chance scholar, so I went away to high school, so I'm trying to help students create that opportunity. And like I talk, spoke about with my brother, Steve, it's so, not that I'm thinking about it, it is so powerful when you state that to see people that look like you in that classroom, but you also said something else that was important that I, I like to say, when you say something, say it again. It's not just being teachers that look like you or administrators that look like you, but also seeing students that you're teaching that they look like you as well. Mm -hmm. And to know that you That's need true. to mark. So it's reciprocity or that symbiotic relationship that happens. It's not a question, it's just a point that in thinking about it, I never really thought about it like that. Mm -hmm. that the, 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 the part where I am actually looking back and I'm actually encouraged, you know, when I see the valedictorian being a person of color. Um, again, I don't, I, I, I want all students to succeed, but be, based on the numbers, right? I teach to all students, but based on the numbers, we don't My name is Teresa Alice. About I've been going to Google Police right? for five years. It's a nice place. The people in this right? stuff and everybody um, in that's here. That's what right? I'm running through early. Dr. Bryant. Um, I, I do have ahead. a question. And the question was, um, with the new focus on chat GPT, how are you all controlling the chat? <laughs> Please email or text contact information for all four programs. I would also love to plan a college visit with the group yes. of students. Okay. Beautiful, yes. Down. Yes. <laughs> That's okay. great. Thank so, you. Okay. So we look forward to meeting you. <laughs> I will set that up. Um, Make sure to ask the contact email. Absolutely. Yes. Chat GPT. How, um, with the big focus on that and um, it being a part, like even this morning I was listening to the news about how it's out of control and people being nervous that it's not control. How um, how are you all dealing with Chat GPT and the work and, and people submitting their work? Just tell us about Chat GPT and college. In well, to what is Chat GPT? AI. No, I'm just saying. Okay. I, I, I love when I'm, I'm, I'm in a meeting all the time because I head my community board and people come on, they start using these acronyms like everybody knows what it is. I'm like, you know, if you're not in it, if you're a parent, you don't know what Chat GPT okay. is. So it is a software, a website you can go to where you can put what it is you want to do. For example, you can say, hey, write me a report on my next speech about politics or, you know, like you said, maybe a, a speech for graduation. And I'll write a speech for graduation for you. Um, the computer will generate a speech for graduation. It will not be duplicated. So it'll be original. You'll have options of different variety of speeches to use. And it will not be plagiarized. It'll be something that you can submit. But now the trend is a lot of high schools, middle schools, college students are using the chat GPT avenue as submitting papers or work. Do you find that to be a trend that you're coming across on the college level? I know that some of the high schools are, and some schools are actually like Brown and a couple other Ivy Leagues are also looking on how to grade these things and they have no problem with it. I feel that is dummying down some of our students and preparing them to think. So what are your take on the whole AI and chat GPT? Look at that leading the witness guy. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> I will try to start some of it. Um, we have quite a few people in place who are supporting us as professors and making sure that the students are giving us authentic work. So we have um, a technology department and that would be led by Dr. Coltman and she and her team sit together and they make sure that 
all of the academic policies in terms of, you know, plagiarism and all of that is monitored and carefully adhered to. Um, if we have concerns, we reach out to them and let them know about the concerns. It has been something that has been brought up to us a couple of times in which we've heard that students have tried to use something like that in their um, writings. And you can tell the distinct difference between the way you write normally and then now this whole new, I put it in the computer and the computer generated this paper that's five pages pages that's totally different than your normal way of writing. And so what we've done so far is start out by with by having conversations with students. It's very important to just sit the student down and talk to them and let them know why this should not happen or why it, it, it can um, lead to even to more severe consequences if it continues. So in the case of most of the time, let's say out of the, the times that has been brought to my attention anyway, we've been able to, to settle the situation just by that conversation, by the child, by the student being aware that we know that you're doing it <laughs> is enough for them to say, okay, that's it. Never mind. I won't do that again. Because they're trying to really be successful and succeed in life. And by the time we finish, especially all three of us, by the time we finish the conversation, they're like Claire on why they're not going to do this. Again. <laughs> is, that, but, is, um, that, is, is that the Bayesian, the French, and, and yeah, the exactly. Is you we your nationality. Oh, oh yes, Susie, where are you from? We didn't get yours. Oh, uh, my mom immigrated here from Austria, and my dad's American as far back as we know. So <laughs> I identify as Austrian because I grew up with my uh, Austrian grandparents and mom. Okay, so so we, we'll take the Austrian part. Yeah. We're, all, we're all American. Um, yes, in, in yes. some way, but we take the Austrian part because mm -hmm. we have the Jamaican, the French. The Guyanese and John, the Jamaican and me, the Haitian and uh, Dr. Brian, and the Bayesian and uh, Dr. Harris. So, no, Dr. Francis. 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 Dr. Francis, what did I say? Dr. Harris? Harris yes. Where did I get that from? I don't know. <laughs> Something's wrong with me today. <laughs> um, I'm going to call it chemo brain. I, I heard Martin T Martina Navratilova used it this morning, and I'm going to use it this afternoon. It's a chemo brain. I'm going to use it again. All right. So, yes. Um, there was a question we were asking as well about the chat GPT and you were, you were talking about the interaction with the, with the, um, so you guys are not so the next level after that, let's just hypothetically say if it continued, then of course we would bring it to the higher up administrative people and share it with them. And then there would have to be a decision made on, you know, whether the student is going to remain in the program or discontinue from the program. And that's pretty much the consequences to it. Um, so like I said, I, I, I big, love when big, when we use big words, I like to use little words, like <laughs> your child will be kicked out. Pretty much. Your, your <laughs> child will be. So wait, wait, wait. I just look at Dr. David Tramatano's face when I use those words. No, your, your child will be put outside. <laughs> like, if you're considered to be cheating, and yes. cheating is not something, there's a moral and ethical clause to you being in school. Mm -hmm. And if you don't obey those things, you'll get your warning, and then your butt will be put outside in the cold. So you're going to free, you're going to feel that yeah. cold on your dear ear because you wouldn't <laughs> listen. I mean, I know you're not supposed to say that, but I'll say it for you. You would put but, outside. <laughs> so if I could just interject, I would say that it, it's very rare, but on the occasions where a student may try, sometimes it's because they're struggling, right? And so we take the approach of like, what are you struggling with? The content, the citations, the reading comprehension. And I think that that's one thing, you know, we take the academic integrity extremely important. You know, it's very important at Monroe College. You know, we really stress that. Um, but we also try to get to the heart of the matter because we know most students like have the best intentions, are they really struggling? And if so, what, one thing that I think is really great about Monroe is like there, we have tons of academic support and we could com come together with a plan to support our students. Um, and the other piece, um, Dr. Metro, you could jump in, but like a lot of our assignments, thank you, I'm Monet Harris, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I, another another thing that, um, you know, really st stands out to me is our assignments aren't just like read a textbook and rehash it. It's like we, we really expect our students to, first of all, we give them choice of how to respond. So they can, you know, create a little presentation, they can create, do bullet points, like we give them choices, like we really believe in universal design for learning. 
Um, and we really expect our students to like apply what they learn. So we want them to think creatively. We want them to think crit crit critically and not just, you know, um, like restate what they've read. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want to jump in. Okay. So <laughs> the, 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 the critical theory. Um, we have another commercial. Um, we just want to make sure to know that we just have about one more minute with you guys. Actually, um, before we go on commercial, how can people reach you? How right. Can <laughs> people reach you, come out for tours. How can some of the schools reach out to you to partner some principals, some superintendent? What are some ways that people can reach out to you? I want to say two things before we get to that. One is that we are, while the School of Education is one entity of Monroe College, there yeah. are many other entities. So I'm going to just name them out so that way if anyone else wants to join Monroe College in any other avenue, these, these are the schools we have. We have the School of Allied Health and Professions. Um, and then we have the School of Business and Accounting. We have the School of Criminal and Social Justice. We have a School of Hospitality Management and the Culinary Institute of um, New York. We oh. also have the School of Information Technology and the School of Nursing. So if anyone's interested in any one of those schools outside of School of Education, feel free to look, listen and think about that as an um, opportunity. Can to you repeat to it again? Repeat it again one more time. The okay. Schools? The School of Allied Health professions, which includes medical sonography, medical assisting, things of that nature, um, school of business and accounting. Um, and then we have the school of criminal and social justice. We have the school of hospitality management and culinary Institute of New York. We have the school of information technology and we have the school of nursing. So those are our various schools and um, we are really excited about that. And I wanted to make sure to just put it out there so that, that people know that there's just more than just a school of education. Now, in terms of admissions policies and or how to contact someone in order to get um, into um, Monroe, we're um, going to share with you the person's name is Zach Young. OK, he's from admissions and his name is spelled Z-A-C-H and Young, Y-O-U-N-G. Um, the email would be zyoung at monroecollege.edu. So the conventional way. Young, way. yes, at, Mon <laughs> at monroecollege.edu. Is that correct? Sorry. Thank you. There you go. Okay. Perfect. Yes. So right, we are Andre, excited to be able to have um, anyone who wants to apply to Monroe College to join us. And we are here to open arms, ready to accept anyone that's willing to come in and want to put in the time and effort and energy that it takes to become successful at whichever one of these careers you pick as a path. And we are so just blessed to have been a part of the radio show this evening. Thank we thank you. you so much. Both you, uh, both of you have been fabulous hosts and I enjoyed every moment of this experience. So thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you so much Andre. for joining us. <laughs> and we you. hope to come back again. Oh, you. you will. No. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. We're going to put a commercial on. Thank okay. you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. My name is Teresa Abbott. I've been going to Global Police for five years. It's a nice place. The people and the staff and everybody in here is very nice. They help us with little things. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. What kind of activities do you do? Dancing, I'm, sometimes I'm an art teacher. Press the button when you touch the screen. The play button. No, it's it's golden. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, we are actually wrapped up for the evening. Oh, there it goes. We are wrapped up for the evening. I want to thank you for joining us today watching you and sharing we're still on the 1000 person we only have a couple of weeks left and we are way behind we saw a 20 percent increase a 10 percent increase so we need that increase to change um and subscribe to our youtube channel at the village radio talk show thank you for sharing joining the village 
My name is Roger Daly. Alongside me is Dr. Joanne Bryant and Dr. John Sampson to our executive producer, Andre Doman, our producer, Sophia Willisey. Enjoy the remainder of your Women's History Month. Yes. For two of you and for every female out there, you are Women's History. God bless each and every one of you. Enjoy your weekend. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you.